I'm here with somebody who many of the listeners will will know. He's very well known for being the designer of the Queen Mary 2, but has had a long and distinguished career both before Queen Mary 2 and afterwards. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Payne to the podcast. Stephen, thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's great to be here, Chris. Really looking forward to it. It's so nice to talk to you again. I think last time we did uh, a YouTube conversation and it was in the depths of the pandemic and we were trying so hard to be to be positive and uh, with really no idea when things were going to go back to normal. No, thankfully that's now just a distant memory. Um, Absolutely. Although, of course, the cruise lines are still trying to uh, recover from the consequences of that, but um, they, they seem to be doing okay now. So you're um, obviously very well known in the maritime community for your your work on the only current active ocean liner in service, which we'll get to later in the podcast. But um, I do know that from previous conversations with you that you've you've been involved in the design of a lot of different passenger ships, but also you had quite a a unique sort of take on coming into naval architecture from a passion as a as a child. Um, so I was just wondering for the listeners who don't know your story, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us how how you got interested in passenger ships. Sure. Well, it was a um, long time ago, but um, coming home from school, switching on our rainy black and white television that we had in those days, um, there was a British children's television program called Blue Peter. Yep. It's still running to this day. It's the longest running children's television program in the world. And that was broadcast twice a week. And it was like a magazine program. Mm. And there was a feature all about the Cunard liner Queen Elizabeth. Uh-huh. And the one of the presenters joined the ship in Cherbourg and sailed with the ship to Southampton. So she was completing a, a transatlantic crossing. And the presenter went on the bridge in all the lounges, stuck her head down to the machinery space and everything. And I thought, wow, you know, this is absolutely fantastic. And if I was using the language of the day, mm-hmm. I would probably say, oh, it was really cool. And of course, <laughs> in my day, we never used the word cool to describe <laughs> it. But that that's how I do when I'm explaining it to the um, school children of today. Yeah. And um, I've looked back and found out that that program was broadcast on the 23rd of May, 1965. Right, okay. So I was five, I was five years old when I watched that program. And that really ensues me so much that um, from then on, I knew that when I grew up, I wanted to be uh, a naval architect. That's amazing. And um, I actually noticed uh, recently on board the current Queen Elizabeth, because of course you're referring to the, the original 1938 yes. built, built ship. Um, but on the current one, uh, there's a display uh, in their Cunard collection and there's references to Blue Peter being on board the ship. I imagine that's a sort of connection with you through your connection with Cunard. <laughs> that, that's right, because um, Blue Peter followed up that program with another one in January 1972 sure when the Queen Elizabeth which was then renamed Seawise University yes was on fire and was lost in Hong Kong harbor and each year Blue Peter published uh, an annual Mm -hmm. and it was a favorite um, Christmas present for parents to give their kids so I've got the um, Christmas 1972 edition Sure. And in that, it has an article all about Queen Elizabeth. and uh, But it's the last paragraph that really annoyed me because it said, uh, the Queen Elizabeth was the last of a great age, a superliner, and nothing like her will ever be built again. <laughs> wow. So, you know, there, there's me thinking Blue Peter is the sort of byword all we kids sort of looked up to. Yeah. And they're suddenly telling me that I'm not going to realise my ambition. No. No, well, you certainly showed them, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very lucky because we, we were learning how to write letters at school. Yes. And my English teacher said the most important letter is the letter of complaint. Uh-huh. So I wrote to Blue Peter and told them what I would do when I grew up. And they sort of more or less said, oh, you know, don't be disappointed if you don't do it. And... 
the crucial thing of this story is that Blue Peter gives out badges mm. and you get a blue one for basically writing in. Nowadays, you get a green one if you do something for the ecology and, and things like that. Sure. Then they have a silver one. And then once every two or three years, they give out a gold one. Right. And of course, young, precocious 12 year old at the time, I thought, oh, I'll go get this gold badge by telling them what I'm going to do. And of course, I got the blue one. <laughs> but when the ship was finally built, they came on board and gave me my gold badge. Oh, that so is so good. That I use so that <laughs> a lot in schools because um, even now you say you've got a gold blue Peter badge and uh, the um, you, kids tend to take note of you if you it's that's not remarkable. a badge. Yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> and so nice that they did that. It's like a closing the loop there with your yeah. your journey. That's I mean, obviously it's great PR for them, but it's, it's so nice that they did that for you. Um, but obviously there's a... Um, there's a lot that goes between deciding you're going to design an ocean liner as a five-year-old and building Queen Mary too. So what is your, what was your, your journey, I suppose, to, to becoming a, a naval architect? Well, in, in the school, I, I was in southeast London, not far from Greenwich. That's where we lived. And I went to a, a local, which we call comprehensive school. And the career service there, when I said, um, you know, when I was sort of 15, 16, deciding what um, higher education to do, when I said I wanted to be a naval architect, they said, oh, don't do that. Engineering is dead. You'll never get a job. And they said, you know, you're really good at chemistry. You like chemistry. So I was pushed, basically. Mm by the career service to go and do a chemistry degree when I left school at 18. And I went to Imperial College in London, started the chemistry course. And then I was very lucky that um, I kept in touch with some of my old teachers. Right. And the physics master, Justin Johnson, went out for a few beers with him. And he said, you know, the careers department were really wrong to advise me not to do the naval architecture. Right. He said, you know, it's something you really want to do, you should have really done it. And he convinced me, in fact, to change wow. midstream. And in those days, university education was funded by your local authority, local government. Right. But they would only allow you three years grant. Okay. Because I'd already had one year doing chemistry and the naval architecture was another three years they initially declined to um, help me but Justin lobbied them very very strongly and eventually they um, relented and um, they decided to give me the three years goodness thank so, goodness <laughs> so I went to yeah University of Southampton did my degree and then became a naval architect and uh, Justin kept in touch and um, in fact I was able to assist him mm -hmm. later on by getting um, lecturing assignments on QB2 oh, wow. so he used to do the computer classes and that oh goodness okay yes on the computer center in two deck <laughs> that's it that's yeah. it and of course he kept very close eye on what I was doing as Queen Mary was announced and yes building up to it but sadly he died just um, a few months before delivery of the ship from prostate oh, that's, cancer. That's no good. No, shame. So hidden on board is a letter, um, like a eulogy, um, describing that the only reason Queen Mary 2 exists wow. is because this physics teacher um, helped me um, get my degree and um, basically saying, you know, QM2 in its form, um, wouldn't be like it is because I wouldn't have been involved if Justin hadn't done it. Yeah. And of course, when the ship's eventually um, dismantled sometime in the long distant future, certainly long after I've gone, um, my hope is the letter will be found and the eulogy and that people will realise wow. that, um, yep, yeah, this, this teacher um, did that for me and, and that's why the ship exists, basically. What a fascinating thing that about Queen Mary 2 that, 
I never knew, and I'm sure many Did people. You? Are, okay. No, my goodness. And I was thinking to myself, <laughs> I have scoured that ship. Like, if it's somewhere in passenger view, I've seriously no, no, seen no, it. No, no, no. It's hidden behind the lining. And uh, when I tell this story on board the ship, um, people go and ask the captain and that, and he comes to me and he says, Where is this? You know, you're not going to tell them, no. Well, I, I haven't told a soul. Good on you. Is. That's amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> There we go. Use the use the, the word. Cool. <laughs> um, and what a wonderful and, and beautiful tribute to to Justin as well. I mean, um, yeah. to have it on that ship. And um, we're just we're digressing a little bit from um, your early background, but I liked your comment there in relation to long distance future because um, I saw you commented on a recent video of mine about Queen Mary 2's longevity. We've been getting so many people messaging in saying she's twenty. It must be coming towards the end of its life and I, I just can't stress enough that this ship is not like the cruise ships <laughs> she's not no she's not built to to be put out of service in 25 years no absolutely and she's so strongly built and um we made very very particular attention to the structure um because i was very much aware of the problems qb2 had yes um, cracking and especially with the aluminium, which we don't have um, in the main structure. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, she, she's good for 40 years um, structurally, and the biggest problem will end up being obsolescence of the equipment on board. Yeah. But they won't be able to get spare parts or make spare parts, and so if they want to keep the ship in service over 40 years, they've basically got to replace... Um, large systems like the air conditioning plant and that sure. which is doable but of course it costs a, a huge amount of money yeah and then you have to balance whether or not it's more cost effective to build a new ship basically and and, and we'll get back to this but speaking of new building new ships in the lead up to queen mary too i mean of, she wasn't your first passenger ship so what, what are some of the other ones that you worked on and, and do you do you have a favourite that isn't Queen Mary 2? So take her out for a moment. Was there one that really stood out for you as a special ship to work on? Well, I joined um, a consultancy called Technical Marine Planning, which to all intents and purposes was Carnival's new build division. Right. I joined them in um, January 1985, and they were just completing the holiday. Sure. So okay. my first assignment was to go to Alborg and get involved in the inspection of the cabins and then the sea trials of holiday. Wow. Okay. Ju Jubilee and Celebration were building in Cockhams in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Although I never did get out to see those two ships. Um, but the first ship from scratch that I was involved with, with Carnival and, and TMP was the fantasy class. Really? Yeah. And we did the concept design for that ship in-house. It was our design. And one of the contributions I made to the exterior design of the ship was by having the big bay window in the promenade that right. jutted out over the side of the ship. So yeah. that was something I suggested and, um, and was uh, adopted. So that was my first sort of um, personal that was, design. That was such an iconic sort of element of that design too, that it, the, the unusual nature, I suppose, at the time of that that coming out over the, the side of the ship, which yeah. has been copied so many times by many different cruise brands in the years since. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we ended up having six fantasies and then there were two further ones where we changed from shafts to pods um, yeah. as, as the experiment to see if if podded propulsion would work and that that was a big success are they the two that are in and service then, now um the last two are yeah yeah so they're the pod of yeah pods. elation yeah. and paradise so the the podded ones are still with us but the uh and that that's very strange because you know, I was involved with each of those fantasies on each of the sea trials. And I remember the fantasy itself. We did the sea trials in, in in January. So the Baltic was absolutely freezing coming mm. out of Helsinki. Mm. And I had to jump from a shell door onto the top of a tender. 
<laughs> in order to go around to take the draft marks so we could work out the displacement of the ship wow. to the speed. And there was no ladder yet installed. Um, there was no safety, no life jackets, nothing. So Goodness I just me. had to leap out of the shell door onto the top of a tender, go around and take the draft readings forward midships and aft, port and starboard. And then I realized that I had to get back on board the ship. So I had to stand on the roof of this tender. And as the tenders were moving up and down, I had to leap um, into the arms of a guy that was outstretched, ready to catch me. Wow. And they said, if you fall in the water, you'll probably die because um, Goodness it's so me. cold. It'll only be a minute or so before you're dead. So yeah, that was one of the. That's the nineteen eighties too, isn't it? Like that's not. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, nineteen ninety. What, what yeah. year was fantasy? Nineteen ninety. Uh, about nineteen ninety, I think. Yes, yeah. I think it was nineteen ninety. So wow, you yeah. think of that sort of thing as like the nineteen thirties, but no, it was <laughs> just. <laughs> yeah, just a few. Yeah, no, that's ago. probably the most terrifying thing I've done in my career. That Goodness film. gracious! So, um, but what was? Um, I remember the fantasy sea trials. We. Um, were force rolling the ship, using the stabilizers to rock the ship rather than stabilize it to sure. find out how effective they were. And we got up to some absolutely unbelievable angles, you know, sort of 30, 40 degrees. And so this huge ship was going backwards and forwards. Yeah. And then we um, heard on the bridge, there was so much damage going on down below that they said, for goodness sake, stop this test. So that was the only time I've been involved where we've rolled the ship to such an extent. So. <laughs> that must have been a bit, um, I guess, that because it, for the first time, I suppose, in history, uh, a few years ago, there was almost live streamed images from scrapyards and fantasy beaching is so that's right, so visually shared. There must have been some some emotions for you to see that. Oh yeah, no, absolutely, come... absolutely, yeah. uh, and. You, you suddenly begin to realise you're getting old. <laughs> oh, I think the last no, few years have done that to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, to continue, um, after the fantasies, we progressed with Carnival with the Destiny class. And of course, yes. that was a big thing because the first 100,000 ton um, group of ships. Yes. In the meantime... Carnival bid to buy Royal Caribbean. So I was dispatched to survey each of the Royal Caribbean ships. And I remember being on the Song of America. Okay. And I was doing the inspection. And then over the Tannoy, um, it came um, the Carnival bid to purchase Royal Caribbean has faltered. Mr. Payne, you are no longer welcome on board. Please leave the ship immediately. Goodness me. Oh, my gosh. How dramatic. And she was the last one of the fleet because I'd already done the Sun Viking and the Nordic Prince and, and the others. So Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, um, it wasn't long after that that Carnival turned their attention to Holland America Line. And then I was sent to survey the four Holland America ships, which was the... Nordam, New Amsterdam, the Westerdam, which was the American mm -hmm. previously, mm -hmm. and of course Rotterdam, Rotterdam 5. Beautiful ship. And I fell in love with Rotterdam 5 immediately because yeah. she was a completely different mm -hmm. ship. She was um, what you would call a real ship of state. Yes. She had that aura about her that. Uh, the old Queen Mary and no doubt Normandy and, and the other great liners had. She still had that. Um, she was in very, very good condition. And uh, so you asked me what was my favourite ship before the Queen Mary, to, uh, and it's it's certainly Rotterdam. Absolutely. Yeah, that's Absolutely. amazing. What a, what, a, what a ship to to be involved in the purchase of too, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, there's, yes, there's I was very lucky because no, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, because that um, enabled me to um, give lectures on board, you know, like you do on on the on the ship. So yeah. I did um, lectures on board quite a few times. I had some tremendous voyages on Rotterdam. So 
I, I quite often have people up at my talks tell me afterwards that they they've been to yours and how how good they are. <laughs> we're, yet, we're, we're yet to be co-booked because we both talk on the same topic, but I, I kind of kick That's myself right. sometimes because I don't get to <laughs> sit there in the audience and <laughs> and listen. But there's one thing you said before, which actually leads me back to a question I had, and it came up in my chat with Anthony Davis just a few weeks ago. Um, the the fantasies were still being, the last two were still being built after Destiny came into service. Their designs are so different from heavy balcony design to quite light on the balconies. So what entertains the cruise line's decision to build a an older style after the newer styles come out? Well, the the order for those last fantasies were, um, they were ordered quite early on. Okay. So, um, yeah, and it went, because um, there's a lot of long lead thing to, to cancel a ship after you've sure. ordered it. You incur such a, a penalty on that, so that that was the main reason. That, yeah. um and, and also, you know, elation and paradise, the last two of the of the ship, they are still very useful for carnival because they can get into some of the ports mm. that um, the bigger ships can't get into. Sure, absolutely. So um, you know yeah. that that's why they they've kept those two. Um, <laughs> Presumably in another world, in a different universe, when the COVID didn't happen, the rest of the fleet would probably still be flying the, the oceans. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Or have found um, a new home somewhere else, you know, because it was quite unusual for them to go straight from Carnival to the scrapyard. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because there, there was obviously no, the um, well, apart from uh, sea jets that bought the Holland America ships and laid them up. But mm. um, yeah. Yeah. No, nice it, see... it was certainly sad to see him go there. Yeah, and it's nice to see the um, uh, Fred Olsen doing so well with their former Holland America ships too because there was a meeting of the two in, in Southampton just recently and the photographs are just fantastic. That's right. Well, you know, I um, was the project manager for the Rotterdam 6 okay. that replaced the Rotterdam. Wow, okay. Um, I was very heavily involved um, and put forward the idea that we should have the twin funnels to replicate the old ship and some of the decorative features inside replicate um, the old areas from the, from the previous ship. So I was project manager of her. Um, she was delivered in uh, late 97. Yep. And I've not been on board her since um, she was delivered. Oh. So I'm very pleased that uh, in a few months' time I'm going on Borealis. Um, oh, how so wonderful! It'll be, it'll be nice to go back. <laughs> Are you lecturing on board or just going as a passenger? Yes, no. I, I'm well. I, I'm I'm going to give a lecture, but um, fantastic! Yeah, so, That's yeah. really great, <laughs> Stephen. We just got to take a short break now, and then we'll come back and talk all things Queen Mary two and what you're currently working on today. We'll be right back. <laughs> Well, welcome back. And uh, if you have joined us halfway through the podcast, I recommend you go back to the very beginning because it's been absolutely fascinating. But um, I'm talking to Dr. Stephen Payne, who you probably know as the designer of Queen Mary 2, but we've been talking about his fascinating career uh, from a passion in ocean liners as a five-year-old to uh, helping design some of the most iconic cruise ships that uh, you'll definitely know and love. Uh, and now we're going to have a little bit of a chat about uh, the Queen Mary 2 story, which I think is one you've probably been asked many, many times before. But, you know, it's interesting we're talking this week because Queen Anne's just been handed over to Cunard and there's a lot of conversation coming my way about the ship. And every time something like this happens, you get the question, why is Queen Mary 2 an ocean liner and why is Queen Anne or Queen Elizabeth or Queen Victoria or any of the others not? Uh, and I thought it might be quite fun to get from the designer himself <laughs> what makes Queen Mary 2 an ocean liner. <laughs> right. Well, straight off, unequivocally, Queen Mary 2 is an ocean liner. Absolutely. And what defines an ocean liner is a set of design decisions such as having a much more pointed bow so you can cut through large waves to have a much stronger hull so that mm -hmm. when you encounter those rough waves, 
you can go through them without the risk of um, the plating buckling and, mm -hmm. and structural damage. Um, a higher speed potential, mm -hmm. so that um, and also the margin. People don't realise that when we design a cruise ship, we add to the nominal power that we find out from the model tests. Mm -hmm. We add about um, up to 10, 15 percent max extra power to account for wind and waves. Sure, okay. So you, that's a service margin, we call it. Mm -hmm. For an ocean liner, you need over 30% more power. Wow, all right. So the Atlantic and the swells, the wind, that accounts for another 30% on top of the nominal power. Goodness. So there's that. And part and parcel of all this with, with Queen Mary 2 is the pyramid shape, mm -hmm. where the sort of mass of the ship is concentrated in the middle mm -hmm. where there's the most buoyancy and right. you notice she's got a long bow mm -hmm. and she's got a long stern where it's mm -hmm. not built up yeah and the reason is that there's not much buoyancy in the bow because it's very fine yeah and likewise at the stern there's limited buoyancy because you need space for the propellers yes so if you're in a rough seaway and the bow and the stern is coming out of the water, you're going to put huge stresses on the ship sure. if you've pushed the superstructure right forward or right aft. Right. Now, on a cruise ship, it's not so critical because you don't, you know, cruise in rough weather, basically, or you slow down to um, a speed where the weather is is not going to um, impact too much mm -hmm. on the ship but to do a transatlantic crossing in a reasonable time you need 22 knots or thereabouts yes. um so that that's why queen mary 2 is the shape she is and everything that's been built in that ship defines her as the liner absolutely and it adds about 40% to the price of the ship yes and also the operational cost because if, if you took queen mary 2 and you built up the superstructure right forward and you had a much fuller bow you could increase the number of cabins you know sure. much more yeah and so you're losing all that revenue by having the line of function and i think one of the things that's really fascinating about Queen Mary too is when you when you say that um, about the loss of revenue, and then when people look at many of the other carnival ships that have that built out structure to maximise revenue, a relatively unique set of circumstances had to all come together back in the early two thousands to even allow for that design to be re reimagined as the Queen Mary two. Well, it, it was Mickey Harrison who mm. you know bought Cunard. Um, for Carnival, and then he said to me, you know, we, we've got no experience of designing liners. He said, mm -hmm. we, the first Carnival ships, the Mardi Gras and the Carnival were liners, but yes. we inherited them. Um, he said, you know, you've got to tell us why you want this liner shape, why have we got to spend all this money? And I, I remember the meeting very well because I showed them the pictures of the Michelangelo in the mm -hmm. Atlantic storm mm -hmm. in 1966. Yes. And I said, um, you know, th this was an Atlantic liner and a big wave hit the front and ripped open the area of the superstructure below yes. the bridge and people were swept out and drowned. Yeah. And I said, um, if you build a cruise ship type form, mm -hmm then that is probably going to be the likely outcome. Mm -hmm. And so they said, well, if you can design something that will convince us that won't happen, if we can make the money situation work, and that was why there's so many balcony cabins on board, um, to generate the premium revenue to yeah. pay off that, that 40%. Yeah. 
Uh, and that, that's how she got built. And, you know, the first iteration of the design, that all the public rooms were up on decks um, five, six, and seven. Right. So there were three decks of public rooms, and the cabins below that were window cabins. Sure. And I got a real telling off from Mickey saying, you know, this just won't work. And uh, so I had to redesign the ship by moving the, the two big public room decks, decks two and three, down to the bottom of the ship, mm -hmm. make them extra high. So instead of three and a half meters, they're four and a half meters high. And that gives us the, the huge public spaces that you have on Queen Mary yeah, 2. Such special spaces. But that lifted deck four to the level that I was comfortable that we could start having balconies. Yeah. Albeit with the um, solid steel bollock balconies, yeah. not the glass front ones. Well, funnily um, enough, for, they're, they're, for some people, they're the favourites. Like I know many people who yeah. will only choose the um, four, five, and six uh, because they prefer that than the glass. So, I mean, other people have a completely different take on things, but that's it. Um, that's yeah, it. so there's, there's an option for both. Um, I I remember, I, I recall um, you telling me also, uh, I think last time we spoke, about how a choice to use the pods allowed for the construction of the Canyon Ranch Sparkler, which is now um, run by Muriel. And I've recently, you know, all those years I've traveled on Queen Mary too, and I always thought oh, it's a nice thing to try, but I, I've never really got around to it. Two, two voyages back, I did a spa day. And this last one I had for the whole cruise, it was absolutely amazing. <laughs> that, that's the lasso therapy pool, that, that hydro pool. There's nothing like it on any other ship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the story with that was that um, we, we had the, the spa designed by the interior architects. And then Howard Frank, the vice chairman of Carnival, went to um, the Canyon Ranch Spa out in California mm -hmm. and then um, convinced everybody that Canyon Ranch should um, operate the spa on Queen Mary too. And of course, they wanted to make huge changes mm. post contract to the design of the spa, which I forget how much it cost, but it, it was a huge amount of money. But it was, we had the pods, but I was worried that um, the steering of the ship would be compromised because they, they were actually uh, originally going to be um, activated by hydraulics. Right. And the hydraulics um, always what we call hunting, and it, it makes the sort of pods wiggle. Mm -hmm. And I was worried that that wiggle would mean the ship would be snaking across the Atlantic. Not good, yeah. But then Rolls Royce said to me, uh, if you're worried about that, we'll do electric steering with the servo motor, and the servo will, will keep the pod dead straight. So by doing that, I was able to delete an auxiliary rudder that I had originally right. intended. Okay. And it was the credit from the rudder and the steering gear that offset the um, price of um, having Canyon Ranch on board. Amazing. So, yeah, that, that was... Because uh, one of the things that I was really proud of was we brought Queen Mary 2 in under budget. And Remarkable. On time as well, which um, isn't always the case. No, and in fact, this week there's been um, another um uh postponement of a, of another cruise lines delivery from from a, yeah. an italian shipyard that's just been happening this week so and i know that that's not the first time particularly post pandemic there seems to be a lot of trouble with getting the ships um built on time so uh yeah a ship like queen mary 2 such a unique um ship to be built under budget <laughs> yeah and, and you know she's the, she was the first ocean liner since qe2 um, so the French had to send their welders back to college to learn mm. how to weld the thicker plates. Wow! That um, she yeah. had, and um, yeah, all all sorts of uh, things like that had to. Uh, um, yeah, she caused quite a stir, Queen Mary too. And what's your favourite place on board Queen Mary too? Well, the Britannia restaurant is very special because I think that more than anywhere else gives you that sort of ship of state 
yep. ambience. And I was very conscious that on the old queens, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, not, not QE2, but the, those first queens, and the Normandy and the Rex and the Bremen, and the, mm. it was only the first class that had the sort of real opulence and, and everything else, the others much less so. And I wanted to provide everybody on Queen Mary too with that ship of state experience. So yes. if you buy the cheapest cabin on Queen Mary too, you get to eat in Britannia restaurant. Yes. And it's the Britannia restaurant that is that huge, um, very impressive um, space. So I'm very, um, very much in awe of that. But my favourite space on board is the Commodore Club. Yeah, okay. The observation yeah. lounge. It's beautiful. And invariably, if I'm not lecturing, um, I'm up there early in the morning working. And certainly um, when Captain Hall is on board doing his rounds, he'll always stop by and he'll say, you're back in your office. <laughs> yes, that's so nice. <laughs> and, that's, he calls the Commodore Club my office. Uh, it's a beautiful place. And, uh, you know, it's much smaller than the Commodore Clubs on board, the the um, Elizabeth and Victoria and Queen Anne. But yep. it's got that sort of special, you got to go to it. It's at the front of the ship. It's It's intimate. It has that view of the bow. And... I sat there in November 2019 and watched the waves crashing over the bow as we were coming out of a Force 12, and it was the most remarkable yeah. experience. <laughs> I only wish I'd had a good phone, a good camera with me at the time. <laughs> I really do. Because yeah. the photographs and video I got from my iPhone 7 at night just don't work, and everyone always says to me, like, people, you know, <laughs> trolls on, the, on YouTube, like, you didn't get a Force 12, that's a Force 2 at, at best. It's like, oh, but it was. <laughs> I just wish I could show you. <laughs> Well, an interesting thing, in fact, with all the windows at that forward part of the ship and also the ones um, in the other public rooms, the British Coast Guard um, asked us to design the ship in such a way that we could put the metal shutters on the exterior of those windows when it was going to be storm conditions. Right. And you look at the old queens and, you can, and even on the Rotterdam, Mm -hmm. um, as, as the museum ship now up at the forward end there are all the fixings to put big metal shutters over the windows and we said you know you j we just can't put metal shutters on those windows on that forward superstructure or, or along the side of the ship so there, there's um, a very good thing in the, in the SOLAS the safety of life at sea regulations which is equivalence yes so we were able to say, look, if we make the glass thick enough and strong enough to be as if we've got the metal shutter in place, will you allow us just to have the glass? And mm -hmm. they allowed us to do that. Yeah. And that's why um, it's laminated and, and there are three or four layers of different uh, glass um, yeah. on those windows. Um, you can and see the thickness if you pay attention. You can really notice it. That's right. And it, yeah. it's because it's the equivalent of having the metal shutter there. Amazing. Amazing. <laughs> and you've got the breakwater, of course, to provide some some safety that that's right. QE2 that's right. didn't have. And she had so many problems with her forward facing windows in those early years. Yes. Uh, and of course, the other thing that she lost um, regularly was the foghorn. <laughs> I know. Was perched up. <laughs> they used to replace two or three of them a year, I'm told. That's so strange. Yeah. And funnily enough, <laughs> because. QE2 obviously had the, the, she had the two on the mast, the, the whistles on the mast, which had that very distinctive sort of throbbing sound, but the one on yeah. the bow didn't have it. And if you listen to videos over, over the ship's life, you can tell when that one's being sounded. There's like slight variations in the sound because it was a circular one, there was a square one and a rectangular yeah. one <laughs> because it keeps getting knocked off. And, of course, they, they put the one at the forward end so that when they sounded the fog on in, in fog, that the sound didn't disturb the passenger accommodation mm, yeah because at the top of the mast yeah, yeah. Um, it used to reverberate throughout the ship whereas yeah. right up forward yeah um it's, it's well, not so prevalent queen mary 2's ones up forward were sounding when we were leaving chan may just recently because it was we sailed into a soup basically um yeah. and uh the ed cabins as i'm sure you remember are right <laughs> right underneath so <laughs> with with this at 12 o'clock one o'clock in the morning we just decided we're going to go up on deck and watch stand in the fog you know like and it was wonderful it just forced us to yeah. leave the cabin and it was just so nice because 
I'd never seen anything where you were standing there. We ended up going to the bit under the bridge, that observation yes. platform, and looking forward. And gradually, you couldn't see the tip, and you couldn't see the forward radar um, yep. post, and you couldn't see the breakwater. It's like, what? <laughs> it was really cool. No, it's, it, until you experience that, Chris, you, you don't realize it, do you? Yes. But the fog it can be um, very, very um, de yeah. deliberating. Yeah. It was, it yeah. was amazing. Yeah. So just before we finish up uh, talking about Queen Mary Tomb, I literally could do 10 podcasts with you about this, but the, the, the question that, so yeah, the, the yeah. question I think I get more than even how long has Queen Mary Two got? And I think we, you know, when I heard from you yourself that she's got a long time ahead of her, but when she eventually one day in the future does retire, the most asked question I think that I get is, will there be another one? And that is where I feel like the combination of the right people, the right chairman or, or, or head of carnival, the right naval architect, they, they kind of combined to create this ship. And it could happen again, but I think that there's something about that that is special about Queen Mary too. And I was just wondering what your take on, on that would be. Well, let, let's say I, I would certainly hope there'd be another one. Um, the combination, I must say, Mickey and the vice chairman, Howard, Howard Frank, were um, an amazing combination. Um, what, what they did within the carnival group was just incredible. And they gave me um, more or less a free hand. And once I convinced them that it had to be the liner and that, and they said to me, you know, go away, design your ship, and then, um, you know, present it to Kinard, get their take, obviously. Mm -hmm. But um, I was able to drive it from drawing the first line on a piece of paper to handing the ship over at the end. And it wasn't like a lot of the other ships that were shipyard driven. It, it yeah. was totally done in-house, um, mostly, you know, the concept designed by me. So um, I know a few youngsters out there. there. There's a young Chilean lad who I'm mentoring at the moment who's at university, who uh, has aspirations of um, doing a, a big liner some time. Wow, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He started uh, corresponding with me while he was still at junior school. So it's been um, a, a good few years now that we've been corresponding. I've been tracking him and giving him ideas and as yeah. i say he's now at university um doing his uh, naval architecture degree so uh, but um yeah i i would hope so and and if the economic circumstances are there that um the service is required and the mm. ship can make money mm. but certainly it shouldn't be done if there are going to be compromises if you're going to need to have superstructures right at the front and the back, then you know you're going to start compromising the structure and what we said with the buoyancy and things like that. And um, you need a certain speed as well. The one week sailing, um, you know, work, works well. It was originally six, but it's now seven days because mm -hmm. of the price to fuel. But to go to eight or even nine days, I, I think would start to get a bit tedious. Mm -hmm. So you need that. Yeah, um, it feels like you've got a sense of purpose, right? When you're on the Atlantic, it's going there and it's not too long, but it's it feels like it yeah. needs to get to its destination because you are on a voyage. And that's that right. adds well, to the atmosphere. Remember sailing on QE2 uh, many times. And uh, after five days, you were just getting into the swing of it when it mm -hmm. was time to get off. Yeah. Um, so the extra and, and day. Quick, Queen Mary too. If she had all of her engines running, she could do it in five. She could. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is amazing. She's, she's got a knot in hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but the the fuel cost, you know, would be uh, through the roof. Yeah. So absolutely. No. That that that's the big problem. Because the, the speed power curve is not linear, it's a cubic yeah. function. So a small increase in speed represents a disproportionate um, amount of extra power and fuel. So, yeah. yeah. 
so all the way back to the era of the White Star Olympic trio, and they didn't want to go for speed because of the fuel bill. So that's you know, uh, yeah, still yeah. still today. Yeah. Um, yeah. One one day, I, I I hope that you will be able to see your your mentee receive a blue Peter gold pin <laughs> for the next ocean liner. <laughs> that yeah, would be so absolutely. cool. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so in in recent years, you've you've been working on a number of projects. Um, one of which is the National Flagship Project. Um, I've done a little bit of uh, reading it, particularly back when it was making headlines. Um, but w- could you just tell us what what that was and and what its current state is? Well, yeah the the National Flagship was um, a proposal to design and build a trade promotion ship Mm -hmm. that would sail on behalf of the UK around the world, promoting British business and interests. Unfortunately, it was one of Boris Johnson's projects and it got dubbed as being a royal yacht um, Uh... to take over from the retired Britannia. So the press used that a lot to um, hammer it and eventually the project was cancelled. Um, but there was um, an invitation um, put out by the Ministry of Defence mm-hmm. for designs for this national flagship, and sure. around 20 organisations bid, and it was a competition, design competition, with very strict um, requirements. Yes. And I worked with Harland and Wolf Shipyard um, to form their proposal. Wow. And we got down to the last two um, in, okay. in this scheme, spent a million pounds on the design, um, did a full technical proposal. We had the basic interiors designed and everything. Yes. And th- then sadly, the project was cancelled. But what, I'm, what, kind I'm of, quite what kind of ship would she have been? She was 15,000 tonnes or thereabouts. Yeah. And she looked like um, a, a yacht, a large yacht. But because it was Harland and Wolf, and because the managing director of Harland and Wolf first went to sea as an engineer on the Canberra. <laughs> yep. Uh, at his um, insistence, it had twin yellow side by side funnels. Oh, how beautiful that would have been! <laughs> that would have been so, so cool. It, um, yeah, so yeah. Uh, and Harland and Wharf, Canberra funnels. So that that was the sort of historical um, aspect wow. to it. Yeah, and um, but subsequent to it all being shelved, I've taken that design and reconfigured it. And I'm quite convinced that it could be operated on a commercial basis, offering um, conferences and exhibition space and cabins for traveling business people. Wow, okay. And if rather than just doing the odd one or two trade trips a year, if it was on a continuous around the world voyage, Mm -hmm. I'm sure that we could... um, get it to pay for itself both wow. in the original build cost and the operation so that is something that i'm uh, working on um with various people here wow, that's amazing. yeah so, that's so uh, cool that that would be uh, another nice legacy absolutely yeah and a ship that has quite a, another one that has a very distinctive profile would be yeah. so interesting in in the current state of shipbuilding yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, aside from working on that, I believe you're also doing quite a lot of work with local schools and colleges to to help uh, mentor the students. That's right. That's right. Because after Queen Mary two, I suddenly w- was thrust into the sort of limelight, um, and the, a lot of people that I didn't know suddenly were coming up and putting me forward for various awards and accolades. There was um, a guy called Jeff Kirk, who was Mm -hmm. the Rolls-Royce designer of the aero engines. Right. So um, him, there was Marshall Meek, who was a a naval architect, and um, Sir Robert Easton was the 
managing director and chairman of um, Yarrow Shipbuilders, mm. where they built the warships in Scotland. And each of these um, put me forward for various things. So I became a royal designer for industry mm. and various other things. And then, of course, the, the big one was Prince Philip then took me under his wing and put me forward for his designer's prize and, and various things like that. Wow. So I feel that because of the help and recognition that I've received, I need to put something back. And so I was a school governor for eight years okay. at a local school and we're trying to encourage the youngsters to have ambition and to yeah. work towards that. So I still do a lot of talks around the UK on, on that theme. Mm. So I mentor this um, lad in Chile, but there's also a guy in France and also um, Algeria. There's mm. a group of Algerian naval architects um, that a similar thing. They contacted me while they were still at school. Goodness. They are now qualified, and we Amazing. do uh, uh, online lectures on, on things. So, yeah. uh, but it, it's um, because of the help I received, and that I, I feel um, it's my duty to put something back, and that that's why I feel that's very important. And um, on that note, you know, you you probably. I mean, I don't know, you're probably one of the, if not the most famous naval architect that most people know uh, today, at least. H how did how did you cope with it, getting that level of recognition? I mean, was it strange to get used to or? Uh, no, not really, because I, I, I feel deep down that I'm quite a modest person. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I don't go out shouting, oh, I've done this. And, that, uh, and by virtue of wanting to put something back mm. and that, you know, recognising people like the Justin story with the, mm. the note on board the ship. So, um, yeah, and, and also my close colleagues, if ever I stepped out of line or started to get, they, they would still knock me. <laughs> down uh, and back that's right because they you know i've got the obe and, and they they coined a yeah. um, humorous uh phrase to um, describe what that meant okay um, <laughs> so you got some you got some proper friends there that can keep keep you grounded <laughs> no absolutely absolutely no. so um, so yeah no, i yeah. i agree with you you you're very modest but i just i just know that if your name is mentioned i mean I, obviously i'm in cunard circles quite a bit but if your name is mentioned within the, the maritime community but also just in general i think i mean you've got a wikipedia page as far as i remember there's all sorts of other Things yeah, that... I don't know. I met the lady that um, put that together, and um, it, she did a remarkable job. <laughs> yes. I, I certainly had no correspondence yeah. with her beforehand. No, so. no, no. That's, that's the idea of Wikipedia. You're not supposed to. In fact, if, I think if they find out that the person is involved, they 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 lock the thing down they because it's supposed it. to be independent. Yeah. Um, but you know, it must be quite. Must have been particularly in 2004 when all that tension was on the ship and its designer it must have been quite quite an experience <laughs> yes yeah, yeah yeah and you know it was very interesting working with the french because um a lot of the companies ha had a difficult relationship with the french and i i was determined that we would work with them as equal partners yes and um one of the things I did, I, I bought um, a lot of little lapel badges of the Cunard house flag. Okay. And I said to them, each time I come to the yard, I want you to present people that are going the extra mile, doing something special, and we'll give them a badge. And we called it the Bloody Mary Club. Mm. Um. And even though these badges only cost, you know, a few cents or pennies, whatever, um, these French people really took to that. Oh. And it got to the point where the management said to me, you're going to have to spend an extra day on your visits because the people that have the badges want to see that you can see them wearing it. Oh, so when wow. you look around, they, and, you know, a lot of them didn't speak English or anything, but... Yeah. Um, 
they got these badges which I presented to them and um, so within the course of the build there must have been a couple of hundred and mm. uh, the French said we've never had a contract where everybody just wants to work on your project and not the other projects That's amazing. and they said yeah. you know it's causing us grief <laughs> <laughs> well you built a good cultural environment there like you put the people and their contribution first and so yeah. they then felt the sense of ownership which is i mean it's something that so many corporations today haven't have forgotten to do and that's why we see so many yeah. customer service blunders and so many companies in, I mean, in australia at the moment there's people angry with the airlines and the supermarkets and everything um yeah because they're not putting they're not putting the people first. No, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and you know, it, it was an enormously complicated ship. Mm. We did have some big problems, really big problems. But working as a team, working together, we were able to solve those problems. Yeah. And that's how we got the ship on time and under budget. Again, we've been ch chatting for an hour. We I could go forever, but um, you know we, we have to say goodbye at some point. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you again. Um, thank you well, so much for coming I've on the podcast. I thoroughly enjoyed it, Chris. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll happily welcome you back anytime. So thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Cheers. All right. Thanks, and back Bye to you, Bye, everybody. Baz. Thank you. That's all for today. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Until next time, bon voyage.